Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by answering a question uh, so we won't have to waste time with it later. The question that comes up is, where can we buy your books? How can we find your articles? And there's a new policy now. You cannot find my books because I'm no longer writing any. And the reason I'm not writing any is that they're too expensive. Nobody can afford them. In fact, nobody can afford anything now. And I want to save you some money. All my papers, everything I write, is now available for free, as Laxman mentioned. It's all available on website, sdcrashen.com. It, most of it is available on ResearchGate. And the reason I'm doing that is I have declared war against the publishers because the publishers are making a lot of money and we have nothing to read. The articles are much too expensive. I can't afford them. The only people who can afford journals and books are people who are right now at a high level university where they can use the library and they can download them. So there's a new point of view. Everything is free. This is now the common good. And I think all research should be freely available. So go to my website, you can download anything and you can share it with anybody, except of course, do not share with Donald Trump. Well, he won't read it anyway, okay? So that's the new point of view. Don't ask for my permission, simply do it. And the articles are short and I hope easy to read. They're much, generally, they're too long. I can't read them, they're too complicated. So that's, that's my uh, sermon for today. Let me get to the three um, different topics. I got interested in this idea of whether people are gifted. Uh, about 20 years ago, when I was in Hungary, and I was there to give some lectures at the university in Page, and one of my students uh, said, while you're here, you should really meet somebody named Lomkato, L-O-M-B-K-A-T-O, the world's greatest polyglot, like 17, 18 languages. And I did go to see her. It was absolutely wonderful. I learned so much. And I took advantage of my relationship with Dr. Lom by bragging about it. I would tell people I met, linguists and colleagues, I've just been with Lom Kato. Do you know about her? They had all heard of her. And they all said the same thing. She's different. She's acquired all these languages because she has a different brain. She's an exception. I talked to Dr. Lom about this and she said, no, I just know how to do it. And I think she's right. There is no gift for language. When we all, this is, like Mar mentioned this, when we all get the right input, we call this optimal input, everybody's gifted. Let me tell you what optimal input is. And I've been influenced by my colleague, Beniko Mason in Japan, who's really made these uh, theories and ideas very comprehensible and has added to them. Optimal input has four characteristics. First of all, it's comprehensible. Comprehensible isn't enough though. Necessary, but not sufficient. Number two, there's a lot of it. You need a lot of input to acquire. Number three, it's interesting. It's not just interesting, in fact, it's extremely interesting. Best is when it, the input is so interesting you forget that you're listening to or reading another language. Very similar to a concept called flow, F-L-O-W. Chinsek Mahali is the author. I can spell flow, but I can't spell his name. You'll just have to struggle with that. Also, the input is rich. There's a lot of language that helps you acquire. As long as there's comprehensible input and there's a lot of it and it's interesting, you are going to get what you need for language acquisition. In fact, the idea I like now, and this is a conjecture, but I have a hunch that it's true, comes from the true master, Noam Chomsky, who says, we all have a language acquisition device in our minds, it's there. We can't stop it. It works without our awareness, and it always is working. You can't turn it off. Just like you can't turn off your visual system unless you close your eyes. You can't turn off your kidneys. You can't turn off your liver just by thinking about it. Um, we have some evidence that I think is typical of the kind of evidence we need. 
And this evidence comes from Benico Mason, I just mentioned, who uh, until she just retired, taught English as a foreign language in Japan. And um, she did a study with her students. She gave a course at the university, elective, open to people from the community. So very interesting, you get all kinds of people. Her students were in their 20s, some were in their 70s. In class, they heard stories. She told stories to them, made them comprehensible. Very good example of optimal input. And for homework, they did reading for pleasure, mostly from graphic novels, but also from young people's literature. Uh, the favorite, of course, Harry Potter, which caused a big positive revolution, I think, in literacy in general. Here's what we found. We took careful, uh, we took careful records. She only asked the students who did the reading to make a note of what they read. That's all. What books? No long book report, etc. From those notes, we were able to estimate how much time they read. Now, these people read a lot, anywhere from 22 to 162 weeks. We calculated their gains on the TOEIC test. Actually, TOEIC test is a pretty good test of reading and listening comprehension. Those are the ones we used. And we correlated them with how much time they read. Very clear answer but much more exciting than we ever thought. The more you read, of course, the higher you did on the TOEIC. In fact, we estimated that for every hour you did self-selected pleasure reading on the TOEIC, you gained about one half of a point on the TOEIC. That's remarkable. If you, leave, if you read an hour a day uh, for 100, 100 days, you're gonna gain 50 points which means you can go all the way from the bottom to the top on the TOEIC in a year if you read for two, three hours a day. You can make extraordinary progress. And let me emphasize, you get better while you're enjoying yourself. It's self-selected reading. If it's self-selected reading, she had a library of 5,000 books for these kids. Self-selected reading, that guarantees that it's going to be interesting, that guarantees that it's going to be compelling. All the research I'm gonna share with you today when I talk about reading is self-selected. If you don't like the book, you put it down, you pick up another one. If it's incomprehensible, boring, you put it down, you pick up another one. I think this is the magic breakthrough. Self-selected reading also is nearly always fiction. Fiction is the winner over and over again on these studies. Now, here's my main point. There was very little individual variation. Very little individual variation. Everybody gained about the same rate. Nobody was gifted. Nobody was slow. Nobody was super fast. From this, the hypothesis emerges. I haven't given you proof. I'm giving you suggestive evidence, which is all science can do for us. When you give people interesting data, interesting input, they all acquire at more or less the same rate. A little bit of variation probably depends on what they read, but not very much. This is my first talk today, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, that when you give people, when they have access to self selected, comprehensible reading, and there's a lot of it, they will grow. They will get better. Now, I have to tell you, I've been experimenting on myself with this. This stuff really works. I've been following Benico Mason's advice. I, I get a lot of good advice from our colleagues on how to get better. She's one of the people whose research has helped me. I'm here uh, at home during the coronavirus, and I'm spending a lot of time at home having a very good time, okay? I feel guilty, all the people getting sick. But I've been experimenting on myself. Every day, I've been working on language. As most of you know, it is extremely exciting to work on languages. Some of, some of my other languages, I'm very good at. Others, I'm just okay. Others, I'm terrible. And when you have that, you discover new things. I decided to work on Spanish. And I have lots of easy books in Spanish. And I've been reading them every day, just for fun, half an hour, an hour, and it's really working. 
I give myself a test once a week, every Friday morning. I'm missing it today. I go to the local supermarket. At the supermarket, there's one hour where old people can shop. You have to be at least 60 years old to shop. So I go there and I always go to the same checkout counter because I always know I'm going to get the same person. The guy's name there is Fidel. He's from Mexico, Mexican-American. He speaks English very well. But the first time I saw him in line, I saw his name and he was from Mexico. I spoke to him in English. He answered me in, I'm sorry, I spoke to him in Spanish. He answered me in English. I then answered in Spanish. I had a little speech already. And I said in Spanish, my goal is to speak Spanish as well as you do. Mi meta es hablar español como ustedes. Tú puedes ayudarme, you can help me. He was very moved by that. How nice of you to take an interest in Spanish. Since that day, every Friday morning, I have been having a short conversation with Fidel. Nice man, he's in his 60s probably. I have noticed, this is the only Spanish I speak. All the rest is reading books, reading these easy books. And I found some very good ones. Every Friday, he talks a little faster. He's a little more casual with me because he feels I'm getting better, which I am. And this is my evidence. This is powerful evidence for input. I'm not practicing speaking. I'm only reading these books, but I'm getting better. And if you try it, you'll get better at the same rate that I do because we all have the same language acquisition device. So this is my first presentation. I'm going to take the liberty of having another sip of this uh, potion that I made from Magic Beans this morning. Do you know where coffee was discovered? Ethiopia. Some yeah. uh, shepherds were watching their sheep and they noticed that the, when the sheep ate the coffee beans on the ground, they got a little more excited, a little more energetic. And my first cup of coffee was in Ethiopia when I was 25 years old. Changed my life for the better, let me tell you. Okay, second. I want to talk a little bit about accent. And my, uh, again, I have a, uh, conjectures here as well. And here is my idea about accent. We are gathering more evidence on this. And I'm, again, beginning to suspect this is really true. Important footnote, all we can do in science is present hypotheses. That's all we can do. And look for supporting evidence and counter evidence. We can never prove that because we can never look at all instances, but we can get more and more hypotheses and eliminate alternative hypotheses. So this is, this is what we're stuck with. Here is my conjecture on accent. Oh, another little note. I learned the word conjecture from my son, who's a professor of mathematics and researcher in algebra. And he says, if you, uh, if you have a hypothesis and you're not really sure that it's true, call it a conjecture. Then if it's wrong, you can say, well, it was only a conjecture. So this is only a conjecture, but I, I think this is right. Here's my conjecture. The perfect accent is inside you. I have inside me a perfect accent in Mexican Spanish. I have a perfect accent in French. I have a perfect accent in German. These are the languages I know best. I don't use them because I feel silly. There is a block preventing me from actually using it because I'm not a member, a full member of the club of people who speak that language. Now, I think that adults get very good in accent, extremely good. They simply don't get perfect. 99% of the accent is not good enough. So you have an accent. My favorite example is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, Arnold speaks English extremely well. I, I have actually met him, spoken to him uh, casually on Venice Beach, uh, lifting weights. I tell everybody I lifted weights with Arnold. Actually, we've had a few conversations. Very nice guy. If you've listened to him speak press conferences when he was governor, his English is marvelous. There's a tiny, tiny German accent. But we want perfection. In reality, he's done very, very well. And it's that little bit of a block that keeps him from the last small part. 
Well, the block we call the output filter. The output filter is prevents us from actually making our best apps accent because we're not a member of the club of people who speak that language. Let me give you why, uh, the evidence why I think this is true. And I'm going to give you um, a, case his, a case history first. Uh, this comes from my time in Ethiopia when I taught there in the uh, 1960s. Oh, my. Um, I met a man there who turned out to become a member, a respected member of our uh, profession, uh, Gerald Mossback, who worked with the British uh, Embassy. And he told me this fascinating story. When he was in secondary school in the UK, in London, he took French. And he and his French hated French. They hated the class. It wasn't taught very well as traditional methodology, forcing you to talk before you're ready, uh, all this stuff, learning the grammar. Anyway, he and his friends despised French for that reason. And at the end of the class, the students had to take an oral examination. I think that's torture for anybody and torture, especially for teenagers at that age, to have to take an oral examination. And he decided to try to make fun of the examiners, to humiliate the examiners, insult them, and show them how terrible they were and their whole culture, everything. He came in dressed as if he were French. He had a little beret on and had French, exaggerated French mannerisms and exaggerated the accent. Like, ah, bonjour, mesdames, messieurs, je suis très tentant. Uh, je suis avec vous aujourd'hui. And uh, guess what? The examiners thought he was wonderful. He got the highest grades possible. Oh, now you've got it. And he would feel very self-conscious talking like that. So the accent is there. It's inside of us. We don't produce it because we feel it's not us. There's a story about the British actor Peter Ustinov, Ustinov that comes to the same conclusion. If you've seen him in movies, my favorite was Top Copy. He was just marvelous. He's been in French movies, and I have watched those movies. Now, I'm not a judge of who's perfect in French, but he sounded really good to me. And I am told that his accent in French, in cinema, in movies, is perfect. He sounds exactly like a French speaker. But in interviews, Ustinev has remarked that I can do this in movies. But if I'm speaking to a French person, yeah, I speak French perfectly well, but I can't do that perfect accent because it's not me. We have the perfect accent inside us. And this is heavily influenced by our affective state. I'll tell you a story about me because you have had the exact same experience. Uh, a while, a long time ago, when my daughter was a little girl, oh my, <laughs> my daughter's now 50, wow. Anyway, I went to Paris for some talks and my daughter came with me. She was a, a young teenager at the time and she was in a French school in Los Angeles. And her French was pretty good. And I, had a, I made an appointment to meet a scholar from the Sorbonne, from the university who was a scholar in sociology of language. And I was very eager to meet her because her work was slightly outside of language acquisition. And I had read some of her papers. I thought they were very interesting. So we met at a coffee shop, which is where you meet people in Paris. The, um, the uh, expression is that if you go to a coffee shop enough times, you'll eventually meet everybody you know uh, who lives in France. Anyway, so we had this nice conversation. We spoke French. And my daughter, and I, I, it was very easy and interesting for me because I was talking about my favorite subject, which is my own theory of language acquisition. And she was telling me about this unbelievable research that they've been doing there that I was really interested in. So it was a very easy meeting. And my daughter was overplaying with the video games. And every so often she came back to just hear how we're doing. And my daughter said afterwards, Dad, your French was so good. I can't, I didn't know you spoke it that well. That was amazing. And I figured, well, I was very relaxing. And I was with this very interesting scholar who was telling me about this wonderful work and she wanted to know about my research. So my output filter was way down because I was only focused on our interaction. There are other times when I'm told I speak French 
without any French accent at all. I'll give you the issue. Um, it was in the 1980s. I had friend, spent a sabbatical semester at the University of Ottawa, which is a bilingual university. And one of the things I did there was work on a project in teaching subject matter through second language, what we now call sheltered subject matter teaching. And I had, we did research and we wrote papers. Uh, we had two research teams, one in English, one in French. Uh, we published one article in French, one in English. And I was meeting with the French team. team. Now, let me tell you about the French team. These are all people that I was very relaxed with, that again, like this lady I had coffee with, that I had a good relationship with, uh, where we were interested in what each other was saying, uh, not critical. Uh, my friend Hubert was one of them. We spent Saturdays together, his children and my children, and his children were under orders to speak only French because they were very interested in the Quebec French movement. And so I was very relaxed with him. Uh, my French teacher, uh, a young scholar, young teacher that I went to her class all the time just to see what was going on and I was comfortable with her. So I was holding this meeting in a classroom, a pretty big room, me and about five other people. The door opened and a stranger walked in, another faculty member, somebody I didn't know. And I thought this must be a local scholar here, a professor. I felt suddenly very self-conscious. I must be making every mistake in the world. Immediately, without my being able to do anything about it, my accent got worse. I'm sure my grammar got worse. The filter went up, the output filter went up, and it was not under my conscious control. Probably wasn't as bad as I thought. Uh, but this is the power of these affective forces. They're beyond our control. Let me make an analogy with uh, other parts of life. To me, language is a little bit like clothing. Clothing has two functions. One function is to protect you from the weather. The other function is to mark you as a member of a social class. Uh, if we were in an auditorium now, not a virtual one, you would look around, you'd see everybody there was pretty much appropriately dressed at home. Some of you are in your pajamas or whatever. Uh, I'm not, I'm okay. Um, but we're all appropriate. When you're slightly underdressed or overdressed, it's quite embarrassing. You have to be dressed exactly right for the group you're with. Uh, I've thought about this. We have acquired these rules. They're complicated. When I speak in public, who knows if I'll ever do that again uh, with the uh, virus going around. Um, I always wear comfortable shoes. I always wear black shoes, solid black, but they're like walking shoes or gym shoes, athletic shoes. They're solid black. They have to be solid black. If I got walking shoes or athletic shoes that had a red stripe on them, that wouldn't work. That's a mistake. So we know these subtle rules that mark us as a member of a class. We know these rules, they're complicated and we're uncomfortable if we get the rules wrong, okay? So my feeling here is that this is a marker, just like, just like clothes has the function of protection and marker as a social class, language has the function of communication, but also is to tell people who you are uh, where you're from, and I think most important, what your club membership is, who you are, what group you belong to. It can also say what kind of a person you're, you are, uh, what your attitudes are. A brilliant study, one of the very first studies to come out in sociolinguistics. A man named Fisher did this in the East Coast with teenage boys. English as a first language. One group, he recorded them, studied their speech in casual situations. One group was known as proper boys, good students. When they pronounced words with I-N-G, going, coming, singing, playing, they always pronounced the final I-N-G. The other boys, who were the more relaxed boys, didn't say coming, going. They said coming, going. Okay, they change the ing to this other uh, final velar sound. Okay, 
it marked them as who they were. These were the boys who considered themselves to be a little bit tough, to be tough guys who were a little bit nonconformist, and it was quite consistent. To me, this marked them as who they are. This is what accent does. Uh, again, accent, accent, I think, is acquired very quickly. I'm, uh, and we get it right away. We just don't perform it. What if we teach people another accent that's never been done, in my impression? Permanently give people another accent through instruction. I've looked at the research. Um, it's not you. It could make you quite uncomfortable. My final topic is writing. And here I'm presenting the research of people who have done work on what is called a composing process. And I, I love presenting this research. I am repaying my debt to these wonderful scholars. I didn't do this research. This is not mine. I've read it and reported on it. And it has made my life much better much more productive. So I'm repaying a debt to people like, especially um, Peter Elbow, who's done research on this. I met him once and I was able to, you know, thank him for his help. Um, the composing process is all boils down. It's how we write to solve problems and make ourselves smarter and how we avoid writer's block. More, let me give you the research in a nutshell. Writing more will not make you a better writer. It will not help you acquire English faster. We acquire by input, not by output. Just like more speaking does not make you a better speaker. It's more listening, it's more input that does this. And again, I'm summarizing the research. The same in writing. If you have your students write more, their English writing, whatever language you're doing, will not improve. Their spelling won't improve, their grammar won't improve, their style won't improve. Writing, though, does something else different. Here is Peter Elbow. Writing helps us solve problems. Meaning is what you end up with, not what you start out with. Writing makes you smarter. Isn't that wonderful? You have a problem, you write it down. Gradually, it gets clear. I have listed on the, the sheet that I hope some of you have, and it's in my articles, the um, elements of the what we call the composing process. There are four elements, and I'm going to add a couple. This is the classic composing process, ways of using writing to make yourself smarter and solve problems. Revision. That's the core. That's the big one. As you revise, as you go over what you've done, you see problems, you change them, and your ideas become clearer. Neil Simon, one of the great American playwrights. Mediocre writes, writers write, good writers rewrite. That is very powerful. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, writing allows even a stupid person to seem halfway intelligent. If only that person will write the same thought over and over again, improving it just a little bit each time, a lot like inflating a blimp, big balloon with a bicycle pump. Anybody can do it. All it takes is time. And now the quote that has helped me the most in writing. This is from Ernest Hemingway. This is not my language. I'm quoting the language of Ernest Hemingway, but he makes the point clearly. The first draft of anything is shit. Isn't that wonderful? Don't be afraid to do that first draft. It's not gonna be any good. And what counts is what you do. You keep revising, you keep revising. When you see something I have written and it looks you know, reasonably good, like I know what I'm doing, you would be amazed to see the first draft. I've gone through not just five drafts, sometimes 15, 20, sometimes 100 drafts. I don't mind it because each draft I see new things. So I'm never afraid to get that first draft down on paper. By the way, I think that this work on composing process um, applies to all instances of writing, not just professional. I also have another career. I'm, I've become extremely famous in show business. I live in Southern California. Southern California, everybody does show business. There must be a law, like you have to be uh, writing a script. 
And I've been doing that too. I've been in show business for the last 10 years. It's been lots of fun. I have written 10 musicals. Can you imagine? And people have come to them because they're a captive audience. I do them for the synagogue. In the Jewish religion, there's the uh, Old Testament. Some Christians call it, in the Bible, we call it the Old Testament. Um, in the Old Testament, and some of you are familiar with this, there's the Book of Esther. And in Jewish uh, religion, you celebrate the Book of Esther every year in a holiday called Purim. And the Book of Esther is about this really bad king who has this wife who's beautiful, and he makes her dance naked in front of his friends. I changed the script a little there. Uh, and she, uh, she is banished from the kingdom, and there's a new queen. The king doesn't know it, but she's Jewish, and she changes everything. Uh, the king's assistant uh, wants, to, wants to get rid of all the Jews, and uh, she says, no, you can't because I'm Jewish. So that's it. It's typical Jewish holiday. They tried to kill us. We resisted. We overcame it. Now everybody's happy. Let's all eat, which is the plot of all the holidays. So I write this play every year. It's kind of humorous. And when I start, I don't know what I'm writing. Even though the plot is set, I, I don't know what to say. I remember Vonnegut. I remember Neil Simon. I remember, above all, Hemingway. The first draft is not going to be good. I start writing, and eventually it's done. And I don't know what I'm doing the first draft. Each time it gets a little bit better, a little bit better. I also have a plan when I work. I start with an outline and I change it all the time. Uh, here's the idea. Good writers plan, but they're willing to change their plans. You have to, because as you write, you get new ideas. I've had instances, one time I was on a flight from Los Angeles to Hong Kong. I had my paper all done for the conference. I decided to review it and do a new outline, which um, Peter Elbow says you should do. Just try to rewrite it from the beginning, even though you think you've done a good job. I did the outline again. I found new things. I decided my paper wasn't done and I rewrote the whole thing. When I have to revise, this is what I've learned from these experts. When I have to revise, I'm happy because it means I'm learning new things. So plan, but be prepared to change it. Another part of the composing process, reread. Hemingway says, I rise at first light. I start by rereading and editing everything I've written to the point I left off. The reason for this, during the time since the last time you wrote, your subconscious mind has been working on this. You have new ideas. So when I start in the morning, I'm gonna, as soon as I'm done here, if I'm still awake, I'm gonna work on a paper and I'm gonna reread what I did yesterday and I'll be pleasantly surprised that all the new ideas that have come to my mind will emerge as I reread the final draft yesterday. The last piece of advice, the official advice, um, is universal. Everybody says it and they're all correct. Delay editing. When you're writing, don't make superficial changes. Don't worry about spelling, don't worry about punctuation. Peter Elbow says, pretend you've hired an editor and the editor is going to come and make changes, gonna correct the spelling, gonna correct the grammar, and of course, hire yourself. If you worry about spelling and grammar while you're writing, uh, your ideas will suffer. So leave that till the end. Don't disturb the flow. As you know, in the morning, you have your shower, then you put on your makeup. Don't put on your makeup, ladies, before you take your shower. It's the same idea. Well, this is the composing process. And of course, I want to add a few points to it that I've come up with. Um, incubation, how to do it. This comes from a mathematician, Poincaré, who was a colleague of uh, Albert Einstein's and came up with non-Euclidean non geometry, worked on it. And Einstein gives him a lot of credit for the development of the theory of relativity. Poincaré did an article that is in all collections that I have of creativity. 
Here's what he says, and this is written about over 100 years ago. He says, when I'm working on my math and I get stuck, which is all the time, I get up, I do something simple. I put some wood on the fire. Two minutes later, I come back to my manuscript and it's a little bit clearer. The writer's block begins to dissolve. I have learned from Poincaré, take breaks, frequent breaks, short breaks. I think of Poincaré when I do what we call inauthentic labor, household chores that we all have to do. They're there to help us incubate. When, when we're done with dinner, especially if we've had company, this is great. I go, go sit down, have some coffee. I'll do the dishes. And they're all, no, okay, go ahead. I close the door of the kitchen. No one comes in. I bring in my computer. I start to work. My goal on my mind is to work on my papers. In the middle, in the breaks, I wash the dishes. I start work. And I'm, I'm telling you this because I'm sure this happens to you. I start work writing. Within three minutes, a writer's block. I'm stuck. I get up, wash a couple of dishes, one or two, put them out to dry, maybe dry one that I put out before. Within 30 minutes, the dishes are done and my work is done. I have managed to get things done. I do the same thing in hotel rooms. When I get, come into a hotel room, it's, you have to unpack. How boring. I put my suitcase on the bed, leave it there, start writing. Within two minutes, my first writer's block, always. I then open the suitcase, take out one shirt, hang it up, go back to the writing. This is how you get things done. Within 30 minutes, the room is absolutely clear, and I've made good progress on whatever I'm writing. Um, you must have a, an interval free from conscious thought. To during your breaks. This is from uh, Graham Wallace, a book called The Art of Thought, uh, published in the 1920s. It's during that time when your problems will be solved. So frequent, short breaks is part of the process. Daily regular writing is my final point. Uh, the, this is Irving Wallace who wrote the prize. He also did an article on writing. He said that good writer, as a rule, all of them keep regular hours. It's a job. They work from, uh, uh, Maya Angelou rented a hotel room near her house just to write. She worked from early morning till about noon and then went on with the rest of her day. Pretend it's a job, do regular hours and sit there for a few minutes, then take a break, then do some more. Uh, some people are uh, do it by the clock. Some people do it by the number of pages. I do it by words. And I'm going to tell you what I do with some hesitation. I don't want you to do what I do. You have to discern, determine what will work for you. If I do 602, I feel stale. It's too many. But it, in all cases, it's regular, regular writing. I'm now going to come to a little bit of research and the best evidence, the best statements of this I know. Uh, I'm going to quote for Stephen King. He says, in writing, writing is your source of inspiration. Don't wait for the muse. Don't wait for the creative spirit. Instead, make sure the muse knows where you're going to be every day from nine till noon or seven till three, whenever you're writing is, have a specific time, start work, and the creative spirit will visit you. Susan Suntag, you can't wait for inspiration. Finally, the best one, Madeline Langle. In this one has helped me more than any other. Inspiration usually comes during work, not before it, not after it. It comes while you're writing, not while you're having a walk or, you know, doing your exercises rarely. It comes while you're sitting there at the desk or at the computer, etc. The um, evidence for this fabulous evidence, I think, 
comes from a man named Robert Boyce. Robert Boyce was a professor at uh, one of the New York State Universities, and he was on the counseling faculty. And he counseled young professors. Uh, those of you who are university professors know how frightening this job is. And in the United States, after five or six years, you're evaluated to see if you get permanent employment at the university. You're, you're evaluated for tenure. Isn't that frightening? This is your, your hand in your portfolio, your publication record, and they let you know if you're going to live or die. Um, Boyce looked at scholars, junior scholars, and found they divided themselves into two groups. One group did what he called daily regular writing, just what I think works, what the research says works. These are people who set aside a certain amount of time for writing, 30 minutes a day, an hour a day. It didn't matter how much time, as long as it was regular. All of them got permanent employment. They all passed the examination. They all got tenure because they did permanent writing. They all published because they did regular writing. The other group is what we're called, uh, uh, I'm sorry, binge writers. That's from dieting. You're on a good diet for five days a week, and then on Sunday you go out and you have ice cream, and your diet uh, goes down the drain. Well, there were binge writers. They didn't write until everything was correct, until they had a quiet spot. They knew they wouldn't be bothered. And they said, I need five hours of uninterrupted time where there's no noise. Airplanes have to change their route. Uh, the phone can't ring. None of those people ever got tenure. They all failed. They waited for the perfect moment when they had lots of time. That is suicide with writing. First of all, five hours is never going to come. Second, when they sat, the few times they sat to write, they forgot where they were. If you don't write for a few days, you don't know what you're doing anymore. Charles Dickens said, if I miss a day of writing, I need a week of hard slog to get back into the flow. You have to do a little each time. Then the incubation will take over. The next time you sit down, you'll, you'll have some more to say, etc. Final comment, should we test writing? No. We won't get better writing if we test writing. We'll just drive people, drive students crazy. If you test writing, first of all, it's the hardest thing to test. It's the most expensive. It requires students practice writing, or at least they think they should. And testing it is very, it's very hard to get inter-rater inter reliability. Uh, raters don't agree with each other. What's a good essay? And it is highly stressful on our students. It's highly difficult to do. I say, get rid of it, don't do it all. Test scores on reading and writing are always very highly correlated. Just look at the reading scores and you'll have a pretty good idea of how well students write. So I'm trying to save a little bit of time and money today. I'm trying to save torture. Let's not test writing, let's not worry about it. We'll save millions of dollars worldwide, billions by not worrying about it. Our lives will be easier and we and our students will get smarter. I'm such a professional. I'm so proud of myself. It's exactly six o'clock here in Los Angeles. I've spent an hour. Uh, let me take a few moments and ask um, if there are any questions. Yes, yes, uh, Stephen, uh, thank you so much. I, I actually didn't uh, disturb you in the middle. I was supposed to tell you five minutes left, but uh, I didn't do that because you were so much, you know, going with the flow. Thank you so much. Um, um, so uh, the optimal input, I think your presentation was itself optimal input and this accent and our internal accent, all these things are so, so, so interesting for us to listen from you. Writing makes us smarter, writers block, incubation, all good ideas. And everybody here in the audience is excited and they, they are pouring with uh, you know, compliments, but there are also questions that they would like to ask you. And here I have my colleague, Asok Sakota, who has collected lots of questions there. So he'll be asking you questions, I think orally many, and uh, some others from the chat box as well. So Asok, please come over. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you and a wonderful uh, presentation by the crash. And thank you so much. And uh, people, more than 300 plus uh, in the Facebook Live and 500 plus, five, around 500 
com completely on Zoom. 800 plus people are waiting, watching you uh, and both the media and, and personal uh, Facebook Live as well. Quickly, let's have a question for you. You said no one is gifted. Why are some students good and some, stu some very weak in our classes, even though we, pro we provide same input and have same activities? Over to you, Krasen. I think that's a wonderful experiment. Let's do it. Let's make sure it's identical, that all the input is optimal. If, do, have we ever done that? Have we ever done a class in English where there's lots of reading material around, the material is fascinating, and students have total free choice? Mm -hmm. I don't think there has ever been a class like that. I'm very indebted to Professor Mason because she has stated these principles so clearly. Let's first make sure our classes are filled with optimal input. The hardest thing, access to interesting reading. We have to number one, look at our libraries. Make sure there's lots of books. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is expense, money. And we're gradually solving this because more and more good books and interesting stories are online. They're there electronically. For, this is the big problem for me. It's finding the books. Right. When we solve that, everyone I have talked to, I've, I've, uh, I know a lot of polyglots. Uh, three years ago, I went to a conference about polyglots, uh, and the participants were all polyglots. I was the weakest polyglot in the group because I could only have conversations in maybe five or six languages. And these are people in a 10, 15. I noticed, <coughs> number one, they were all nice people, which is interesting. They were all fun to talk to. They were all supportive of each other. They had the affective part uh, really down. They liked having conversations and they were readers. Isn't that fascinating? Everyone I talked to, okay, they all had access to optimal input. So first, let's look at our classes. Let's look, that's why the, uh, the situation that Dr. Mason, uh, Benico Mason set up was optimal. A collection, let me repeat this, 5,000 graded readers available for students. This is wonderful. We look at, uh, even if they, we're doing native language or we're doing English, official language of India, for example, do we have, books available that are affordable. The highest level of, of, uh, in, of low literacy, of course, is high poverty. They're the ones who can't get access to books. It is our job to do that. So my answer is, if we first make sure we have optimal input, then we can ask the question. So thank you, just right. Question uh, thank just... you. There is one more question, uh, which is particularly concerned with the remote learning. How do we use, or how do we engage the students of remote areas in learning. Can you deliver Again, your ideas with input hypothesis? Yes, I think we can do it. Um, it's a good area for experimentation, of course. Yeah. What really counts in language acquisition, input, we can supply that. For example, the initial stage of language teaching in Dr. Mason's method is stories. Listening to very compelling stories and being knowing the students and stories going to great efforts to make them interesting and comprehensible. Uh, in Dr. Mason's class is drawing pictures. She can explain words that she knows are gonna be hard in advance. And we have lots of that. Now in remote learning, the students can't talk, doesn't matter. We don't need them to talk because that's how, not how you acquire language. How do you like that? We, they can't interrupt and say, I don't understand, I don't understand. Well, if the story is too hard, we do what we do when we watch television. We change the station. I would like language classes to focus on good stories, stories that are of universal interest and allow options. Like if you're listening to a good story in, in an English class or a French class, you have the option of 20 different stories at 20 different levels and on 20 different topics. You don't have to stay with that one. You're not tested on the content of the story. You can listen for pleasure the same way we change the station 
watching television. In fact, uh, remote learning might be just made to demonstrate the power of stories. That's the beginning stage. And we introduce students to where they can find good books. And we have the power, we have the essence of the proper method. Dr. Mason's method combines listening to stories and reading for pleasure, self-selected. We can do that, no problem. The stuff that we can't do never did us any good anyway. So I think that's the answer, stories and pleasure reading. Okay, I've got a question uh, here, uh, you, Stephen. Uh, so, so can I ask a question here? Please, please. Uh, then I found it interesting. It's about writing. Uh, you know, our tradition of you know evaluating writing is only from the final product, and and then the process is uh, hardly uh, you know given uh, due due uh, importance. So, what's your suggestion on this? This authentic evaluation of um, uh, of writing uh, when final product you know has the grades. Don't evaluate writing at all. Okay. I just saved you hundreds of billions of hours of torture. Number one, it's the hardest thing to do. We have very poor inter-rater reliability. It tortures the students. They hate it. It tortures the graders. Nobody likes to do that. Oh, God, I've got to grade this writing thing, et cetera. It encourages more writing, and that doesn't help you. So forget it problem <laughs> solved oh i see then there Thank is a you. same question linked with the just what you said in this situation how can we encourage our students in academic writing then <laughs> we encourage them by oh here's what someone once said i forgot who i'd like to quote them read what you like write what you must we should never require writing of anybody unless it's something that burns inside of you. Now, the people listening today, the 500 people, most of you love to write because you're academics, teachers, you get ideas, you like to write them down. It's not for everybody. If you fall in love with writing an idea and you find that when you write it down, you get a clearer idea, keep diaries. Oh my, everybody knows this. This is so powerful. You have a problem, a personal problem. You write it down immediately. 10% of the problem disappears immediately, maybe even more. That's why people keep diaries. It's helped me, it's helped you. When we introduce students to the composing process, I think we should tell them about the composing process, they will be drawn to writing and their writing quality will get better as they read more. Simple solutions. We want to make the world a more pleasant place. Thank you. Can I ask one more question, please? Please, no extra charge. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> with reverence, you said that something is learned with good input. You said that something is learned with good input. If input is not changed into intake, we, not, we normally write and practice for intake. In our case, we believe this. And what's your thought over this? Well, the optimal input is intake. That's what it is. Uh, and it, it helps, our, helps us to acquire language, not to learn it, to acquire it subconsciously. Intake is optimal input. Our goal is input that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So interesting that you don't even know it's in another language. That's why I like to allow lots of choice. In stories, we can't do that perfectly, but we can come close. If in beginning language teaching, there's variety in the stories and the student can select the kind of story the student wants to listen to. Mm -hmm. Not everybody likes fairy tales, okay? Not everybody wants to know grim stories, etc. But you can select what you like. And then when you start reading, you read narrowly and you select what you want. What I do with my, I've done with myself, and you've done it too. I use reading. I use reading, ninety-five percent to keep up on my languages and improve. I do a lot of. I've learned this from Lom Kato. She, all her reading is in other languages, not all her pleasure reading, which is why she can keep them up. And I find the authors that are perfect for me. By the way, 
I don't like it when people recommend books to me. To me, when someone says, or they give me a book as a gift, oh my gosh, someone gives you a book as a gift, then they ask you a week later, how did you like the book I gave you? I never read them. I have to select the book. I never give people books as gifts. I let them select their own books, same with my children. Well, there's one exception. There's one person when he recommends a book, I always read it immediately because he knows me. He knows me better than I know myself. And he's always right. And that's my son, the math professor. He says, dad, read this one. He's always right. And we have people in our lives who can do that. But in general, assigned reading is the problem. Now this means some change in how we teach. I can't help that. I'm not here to make the current teaching program work. I'm here to try to provide what, try to tell you what the research says about the optimal way. And I think we can gradually move in that direction. The more self-selected reading, the more bigger our libraries, the more choice, the better off we're going to be. Okay, thank you.